Good morning everyone, this is Stephen Gregg again and uh, today we're going to be going through uh, my story and the message of the story is called The Mindset of a Trailblazer and I'm going to be going through, um, you know, like I said the last time this is where my life began. This is where everything just took off from this point. Um, like I mentioned before, um, I was, you know, living with this girl um, in Inglewood um, actually, I think we were in Inglewood, or we may have been in Hawthorne at that time. Um, I think it was Hawthorne. We were living in this apartment, I was working at Circuit City, um, and my buddy Malcolm was around at the time, and um, we were just sitting there watching TV or talking or something, and I remember her dad. Her dad was a unique guy. Um, they lived, you know, in a different part of L.A., and her dad used to come by every once in a while and bring unique stuff to us. Um, unique stuff meaning uh, just not normal stuff that everybody would bring over and but this particular day was different I remember we were sitting there it was a nice beautiful sunny day and we we're just hanging out around the house or whatever and her father came over and he was kind of like a Fred Sanford kind of guy you remember Fred Sanford he like a junk man he was kind of like that not really that I don't know about his personality but the way he had a bunch of stuff in his truck so he would actually come over and he brought, that day he brought some unique stuff. He brought a violin, I remember that. He brought these drinks and they were these um, uh, like sparkling raspberry iced tea sparkling or something like that. It was some weird drink that we had never heard of. And then he brought these little bars called Kudo bars. At that time we didn't know what those were. So he brought those and he brought some other little doodads and stuff. But the one thing he brought was a, a, a cassette. I mean, not a cassette, a, um, a VHS tape. And that VHS tape um, had a unique title, because I looked at the title of it. And it was called, Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. And um, the guy's name that um, made the movie at that time, in 88, 89 or so, um, his name was Jawanza Kanjufu. You can look him up online. He has the video, the same videos, um, online now. So it was two sides. So the other side, I can't remember the exact name of the other side of the video, but it was two parts. And I watched it. I watched the whole thing. Um, she watched it. Mia watched it. Um, and then I don't know what happened that day. I don't know what God was doing in my life at that moment, but he did. Because something sparked in me that... I can't explain. What I mean by that, something sparked in me. Something lit up and my heart just started racing and my mind just started turning. And I said, I don't know what's going on here in this world right now. There's something weird going on because why are we called so many different names? Why are we called black and African-American and Afro-American and Negro and ne nigger and all these different you know, adjectives to describe us? Who are we? And that's what this video talked about. Who are we as a people? Stephen Gray, who is this black person? Because I know we couldn't have just started 400 years ago in slavery. Because that's what the video was talking about. We had to have come from somewhere else. Well, we just come from Africa. Well, who are we? Because Germans know who Germans are. They came from Germany. That's where the family were from. You know, Russians know who Russians are. They came from Russia. It was easy, it's easy for everybody else. Mexicans know that they're from Mexico. But where was I from? That was the question that this video posed. And he, but he posed it in a very unique way because he, he went through the school systems, talked about how the school systems were there to, to destroy black boys. He talked about how the teachers, um, some certain types of teachers, women teachers don't know how to teach boys. I don't know if that's 100% true. My wife teaches my son in a great way. And a lot of great men came from women teachers. So I, I don't know about all that part. But there was just a lot of little things he talked about that struck a chord in me. And when it struck that chord, I just said, you know what, I gotta do something about this. Now, remember, I'm 18 years old. I, I don't have any money. I don't have any, nothing. But you know what I did have is I had a, a spark in my eye. I had a spark in my heart that I needed to do something about this. So what I did is, got a pen um, uh, and, and paper, and I started writing some notes. And I wrote down four pages of notes of this big, um, project I wanted to create and um, as I was writing it I stopped in the middle of it I said you know what I heard there's this place called Tent City 
So I went downtown LA and there was a whole area right by where the 10 freeway and the 110 freeway meet, right there in the corner. And I went over there and I looked and there was an entire sea of white tents. And those white tents were places where people lived. And I just looked and I was like, good night, all this homelessness. I said, I gotta do something about this. I've gotta do something about it. I said, you know, this is something God put on my heart. I wanna, I wanna do something big. I don't know what I can do about this. I don't have any money, I don't have anything, but I wanna do something. So I came back home, I finished writing out my design, and I wrote out this four and a half page document. I'll show it to you next time. I'll, I'll print one out and show you. But I actually wrote out this big document. And when I wrote it out, I, I, I just said, what's the name of this thing? What, what can I call it, God? What, what do I call it? Now, you gotta remember, when I'm talking to God, I'm just kind of frivolously talking about God because I didn't really know God. I wasn't a disciple of Jesus or anything. I'm just, I would just ask that question because my mom used to always say, uh, put God first. That was her, as I'm on my way to the nightclub, she would always say, put God first. So I, I would always talk about God somehow. Um, it's just kind of innate in me. So I was sitting there and I said, well, what should I call this thing? And he gave me a logo. And this logo was a man standing up with his hand and it was on like a little moon or whatever. And it said, it said, it was called Inner Prize, I-N-N-E-R-P-R-I-Z-E, -E, Community Access Network. Inner Prize Community, Community Access Network. Now, at the time, I, I said, wow, that's a powerful name, you know? Let, let me go and get that trademark. And I did, I got a trademark at the time and stuff. I didn't do anything with it because I didn't have any money at the time, but I was excited about it and I wrote up this, this document. And I went and I took it and I, I started sharing it with my friends. I was like, hey Malcolm, Malcolm, check this thing out. And I had Malcolm watch the video. So we watched it together and he helped me write out this four page document. He was inspirational in some of the ideas in that. And then he showed it to his wife and his wife proofread it and rewrote it again for me. And then I showed it to me and she was excited about it. We were all there together, all fired up for this um, Enterprise Community Access Network. So I just went on a hot pursuit. I just said, you know what, I got to find the money. Now, let me tell you what my mindset was. Because of who the people that were had the conspiracy to destroy black boys, who those people were, in the video he talked about all these different families, these 13 bloodlines that are in the world, you can look them up online right now, you just look up the 13 bloodlines or, um, you know, there's all kinds of things you can look up. Um, and <clears throat> now I know more, much more about them now, but back then, I, all I knew was that these bloodlines that, you know, suppressed the world in different ways. And so I just said, you know, I'm not going to tell any rich people how this works. I'm going to do it myself. I got to figure it out myself. I got to raise the money. I got to build it. I got to do it because if I tell somebody about it, they'll do it the wrong way. They'll do it for the money. And that's not the reason to do it. It was going to be a community center that was going to help children and help them with their thinking. It was going to be a community center that was going to help adults and help them with their thinking. It was going to help the teachers be able to teach the kids better. It was going to be a big community center that was going to have fun. <clears throat> And a um, worship in there, and there's going to be singing. There's going to be an auditorium in there. There was going to be pool and a pool in there. There was going to be, um, you know, computers. Well, th yeah, that was when the laptop and stuff had just started coming out of those computers and stuff a little bit. And there was just, it was just going to be this amazing place. And then the intent was to build one of those facilities in every major city around the world. That was my goal. So you can imagine this was going to cost billions of dollars to build. And at the time, I didn't have billions of dollars. I probably didn't have 50 cents in my pocket, <laughs> to be real with you. I was broke as a joke at that point. But it didn't matter. I still had a big dream that I believed in. And so I, I decided, you know what, I need to do something about it. Uh, so what I did was I decided I bought some making memory tapes. That, um, I mentioned the guy, Kevin Chadeau, one of the guys that I was inspired by. He had these tapes online on, on um, infomercials called Mega Memory. So I bought those Mega Memory tapes and I um, started listening to them. Now, I don't remember anything about the tapes other than one thing. Uh, and this one thing sparked my entire life as far as my thinking and taught me how to think properly and how to grow properly. And it was what's called the four levels of learning. Um, those four levels of learning I learned that day and I actually learned how to learn. And those four levels of learning, I'm not going to teach them today, I'll teach them another time. 
But those four levels of learning, you can probably watch a video on one of my websites or something uh, about what the four levels of learning is. But the four levels of learning is one of the most impacting um, technologies that I could say I've ever learned and probably one of the most valuable things I've ever learned um, over anything else with the exception of the Bible and the Word of God. That's how powerful these four levels of learning was for me. So what I did was I, I learned them, I mastered them, how my brain works to, to learn new information. So I learned those four levels and so you know I did, I said okay, now I got it, now I need to go out and make some money. I need to do something. So what I did was I said, well, how can I make a boatload of cash with no money, no experience, no nothing? Um, so what could I do? Because remember, I had no money, I had no knowledge, I had no friend support, I had no family support, I had everything was crazy. My friends thought I was a nutcase because they're having this gigantic dream. Steve, how are you going to do that? Get out of here. Go back to work. Go back to selling cars or something. There is no way you can do that. And I said, well, there is a way I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. If it can be done, I'm going to do it. And I wrote it down and everywhere I went, every business I went into, every job I took or every sales position I was in, I told people that's what I'm doing. See, it didn't matter <clears throat> what I had. It didn't matter what I didn't have. It didn't matter what I knew. It didn't matter how much money I had. You know what it mattered? Is that I had a big dream that I believed in. If nobody else believed in that dream, I believed in that dream because I needed to take care of my people. I needed to take care of my people. That was my mindset at the time. So you know what I did? I did something crazy. Um, I joined some network marketing companies because that was about the only thing I could do at the time because network marketing, you can get into network marketing with no, no experience, no money. So what I did, um, um, one of the first ones was an insurance company. Um, a, a buddy of mine named Louis Jonas and Tony Jonas at the time, um, he was the brother of Fernando Jonas who worked at the car dealership who trained me in sales. Um, Fernando was a brilliant salesperson and trainer. He taught me sales. And so I went over to um, uh, his brother, Tony, had an office, an insurance office. So he started teaching me the world of insurance so I could start building a residual income. And I did. I started selling insurance and I was in the top 13 salespeople in all of Southern California from here to San Diego. I was at number 13 in a very short period of time. Started generating good money and my residual was coming and I was on my way <clears throat> until a couple months later the company went out of business. And so now I was uh, back to square one again. Okay, so then from that point, um, you know, I went into another company. I, I found this other network marketing company called the Diet Cookie. And now, if you don't know what the Diet Cookie is, it was these little um, organic cookies. They had no fillers in it, no um, junk in it to basically, uh, you know, you know it's no fillers and no, no garbage type of stuff in it. It was organic. So uh, I got these diet cookies, and somehow I acquired about $15,000 worth of diet cookies. Now I'm out selling these cookies door to door, uh, not door to door, friend to friend, and family to family, and business associate to business associate. <clears throat> I'm trying to sponsor some people. Had a little bit going on, but I ended up acquiring $15,000 worth of diet cookies. Now, if you don't know what $15,000 worth of diet cookies looks like, it looks like from maybe that wall behind me, all the way uh, to this wall, this high off the ground, but this, you know, deep a stack of boxes. It was just boxes in my living room. Boxes and boxes and boxes in my living room in um, Hawthorne. And at that time, you know, it was crazy because, you know, California don't get too much rain, so it was hot. And I don't know what you know what it looks like with uh, in, in the summer here, but, you know, it was hot and dry and those cookies had no preservatives in them and so I actually ended up with $15,000 worth of rotten cookies in my living room and so now uh, because those cookies were you know I don't know what happened but the company ended up going out of business again so now I'm chasing my dream again and all of a sudden now I got $15,000 worth of wasted money and rotten um, diet cookies in my living room from that point um, myself and Malcolm uh, we, I found a company called Dermashield because um, I went to this presentation and they had this product that you could put on your hands of this skin protector. It's called Dermashield, this big old can about that big. And they claim that you can put anything on your hand and it will wash right off. It will, nothing will stick. Um, so they said oil from cars won't stick. So me and Malcolm, we, we were kind of trying to do this together because he was inspired from my I can at the same time. So we would put this derma shield on our hand and we would go to car dealerships and we would go to auto mechanic places and, and ask him, hey, well, let's put some grease on our hands. So we put grease on our hands and rub it all around and we'd go get the derma shield and wash right off and they'd buy a can. 
And then I'd go to another store and buy a can. We were going up and down Hawthorne Boulevard selling one can at a time to a place like that. Um, but then they had a unique claim. They also claimed that, you know, you could put acid on your hand. And if you put acid on your hand, it won't burn. So I'll show your chemists and um, doctors and all kinds of stuff. So what I did was I said, you know, let's, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's, let's try it. And he was like, well, okay, well, where do you get acid from? I was like, I don't, I don't know. Where do you get acid from? Where do you live? So look at the phone book. Because there was no Google back then. So I said, look, look at the phone book. So we did. And we found that you have to go to a chemist to get out, um, acid at the time. So we went to the chemist. We said, we need some acid we want to put on our hand. What's the strongest kind of acid you got? He goes, it's uh, called pure sulfuric acid. I said, okay, well, we'll take some. We'll take a little bit of it. What you got? He goes, here's one ounce of it. I said, yeah, that should be fine. We're just going to do a little test just to make sure it works. He goes, well, test? What kind of test? He goes, well, we're going to put it on our hands and see if it burns through our skin with this protected on. He said, no, 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 no. You don't want to do that. And I was like, well, why not? He goes, because this is the kind of acid that if you drop it on the ground, it kind of burns a hole through the ground, you know, until it just runs out. It just burns a hole through anything. This is not the kind of acid you want to put on your hand. I said, no, 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 but I, we got to believe this product. We trust this product that it works. You know, we've seen some demos and stuff on videos that it could work. So we, we, I need to believe in it. He was like, well, you know, you got to sign this waiver and, you know, we're not responsible. And I was like, yeah, no, I understand. I get it. So we did. And what we did was we went home and we um, took that acid and we went in the back of his apartment building. And uh, we got a rock. We got a nail. And there was an ant crawling by, poor ant. <laughs> Ants always been all my life, you'll hear about that later too. And this poor ant came by, walking by, and, and so we got the ant and we poured it on the ant, and the ant was dead instantly, of course. And then we poured it on the rock, and the rock disintegrated, and then we poured it on the um, little nail. And the nail just kind of melted into nothing. And we're like, okay, well, um, let's, let's, let's put lather up. And so we lathered up. And uh, we got the little dropper, and I said, okay, Mal, you first. He goes, no, 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 you first. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. Um, how about we do it at the same time? We'll just drop it boom, boom, real quick, we'll do it at the same time, and we'll see what happens, okay? And uh, we just got to be prepared to wash this stuff off real quick. He goes, okay. And I said, drop, drop. And we're standing there, and we're looking at our hands, and we're looking, and we're waiting, and we're waiting to see it burn, and, and we're waiting, and then it's, and we're, we're looking at it, and... And nothing's happening. It's working. And it's working. I was like, that's awesome. So we poured it off real fast. We said, man, this is awesome. We gave each other a pal, gave each other a hug. We said, man, we are rich. This is it. This is going to go. I can't. This product is going to kill it around the world. So we went in the house and got water and washed our hands off. And then all of a sudden it started to burn. We started seeing this big scab in the middle of our hand. We're like, what the heck's going on here? And we didn't, he didn't tell us that water makes it a little bit more corrosive. And so, uh, you know, but fortunately, it didn't burn a hole in our hand, so I, I can't look at you like this through my hand. Uh, so that, that's the good thing. It did work. So we went out again, and we started going to chemists, and we started going to hospitals and all kinds of places trying to sell this Dermashield. The problem was, one can would last like 10 years because the can was a big, gigantic can, and people there was no reorders of the product. And the company, I don't know what happened, but the company ended up going out of business again. So as I'm in hot pursuit of my dream, my first three companies went out of business. And you got to remember, when I invest in something, you know, I go all in. I push all my chips in, and I say, I'm in. So, you know, with, with the, the insurance, I had put a lot of money and time and effort and, and spend, and I, I was going into debt. And then when I was in the, uh, that, that business with the um, Diet Cookie, I, I spent a lot of money and went into debt. You know, credit cards and all kinds of stuff. I'm 18, 19, 18 years old, 19 years old. Got all these credit cards, 20 years old or so, and got all these credit cards that have asked. And, and so I'm going into debt, and then, I, and then it goes out of business, and now I got all these wasted money sitting there. So I now you know, have gotten to this Hunter Heritage. I bought all these cases of all this Dermashield, and the company goes out of business. So now I got all these cases wasted again, and I'm back in debt again. And so... You know, my first three go-arounds, going after my dream, I was in debt. I'm, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction. I'm trying to make the right decision, but going the wrong direction. And it, and it kept happening over and over. And you're going to hear more stories on the next video about, you know, what, what ended up happening. But I can tell you right now, at this point, I'm getting kind of discouraged, but I'm still fired up. Because my dream, 
you know, countering the conspiracy to destroy my boy just didn't go surface deep. It went to the heart. It went to my gut. It went inside of me to the point where there was nothing I could think about. There was nothing going to stop me from achieving that dream. So what if three companies went out of business? This wasn't a surface um, dream. This was a deep seated, um, committed dream. I wasn't interested in being successful in this. I was committed. I was all in to helping my people. And God knew that. So, you know, I, you know I'm out of time right now, but I just want to say um, this was the beginning of, of the story. And on my next video, I'm going to share with you some more stories of some of the things I had to do to pursue my dream. Some of the additional things. But I just want you guys to know, thank you so much for listening to my story. And, you know, I appreciate you guys being here. You know, you can check a look at some of the things I do, but I love you guys. And I'm here and I hope this message touches your heart and really inspires you to go after your dream. All you need is a spark and have a burning desire to achieve it. I love you guys. Talk to you soon.